today say this together, that today, today. is a great day great. to be in God's house. Yeah. And I'm thankful yeah. to be a child of God yeah. and overcoming victorious, prosperous child of God. And I'm now ready to receive his word that will help me to use my tongue in the right way. Everyone say amen to that. You may be seated again. Good to see each and every one of you. Glad that you are here. I realize that you could be a lot of other places. You could be uh, doing a lot of other things like fishing in the canal right now. But uh, <laughs> hey, if you go fish in the canal, I, I, I ain't making fun of you. I ain't hating on you whatsoever. But we, we drive by a big canal uh, the vast majority, every time we leave our house, we can go obviously one or two ways. And the majority of the time, probably 90% of the time, we go one given way, we, we cross a big canal. I grew up here. I grew up uh, swimming in canals. And you, you sh I don't advise that. Don't do that, though. But, um, and on occasion, we would fish in canals as kids, you know. But we, we drove by that canal, like this morning, drove by that canal, and it was like a elbow room. People just standing there fishing. I'm going... And I, and I did, that came to my mind. Well, I could be out there fishing in the canal right now. But anyway, there again, if you fish in the canal, God bless you. Knock yourself out. Ain't making fun of you, okay? If, it, if, that's, if that's your thing, that's good. I, I'd rather fish um, in, a, in, a, in a swift moving stream myself. But uh, anyway, okay, Proverbs 18, 21. <clears throat> I know you know this by now. You can quote it. And it, we'll probably conclude this today. Uh, I, I, I guess I shouldn't speak for the Holy Spirit, but um, my, my plan is to conclude it today, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Are you two weeks from today, Resurrection Sunday? Can you believe that? Man. Where has this year already gone? Huh? Of course, this, this year in our calendar, uh, we got Resurrection Sunday, the last day of March, and... Um, Man, coming up upon us. Uh, Trinity, glad you're home for spring break. Glad you're home to be back with us. And uh, talking to her just a couple minutes before service, asking her how things are going. said, good, but uh, her economic class, a little challenging. I said, hey, if, if you need a tutor, um, it ain't me. But anyway, no. death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21 says, right? And of course, those who understand it and apply it properly will have great fruit, good fruit in their life, correct? That's pretty much the literal translation. It's a work, working literal translation of the last stanza of Proverbs 18, 21. But that first stanza declares death and life are in the power of the tongue. And uh, we've been looking at that in many different facets, understanding that our words are very powerful, right? We, we are living proof that words are powerful. People have spoken... Uh, things that hurt us, wounded us. Uh, maybe some, uh, some cases in our life, it derailed us even for a while. It, you know, verbal abuse is real. And verbal abuse, meaning, you know, I, 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 li I like to study certain things from uh, clinical uh, psychologists, not that I adhere to them whatsoever uh, in many regards, because there again, the spirit supersedes the soul. And you can't you can't fully help someone when you're just delivering uh, uh, psyche, uh, psych problems, uh, uh, psych scenarios from their psych problem. Because uh, the soul can never get set free until the spirit gets set free. That's why we looked at that last week when Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So Jesus always goes to the root of the matter, the heart of the matter. Heart, many times synonymous with the word spirit in the, in the Bible even. Um, See, we, you have to go to the root of the issue in order to take care of the fruit, right? Especially if it's a bad, bad fruit. So we, we go to the spirit of the matter, and, and words do matter. But clinical psychologists, they prove, and it's like, well, yeah, the Bible already says that, is that verbal abuse can be as damaging as physical abuse. That verbal abuse can also be uh, perpetuated throughout generations, because many times, as the old adage goes, and it's sad, but it's true more than it should be, and that is that, that parents parent how they were parented. And, 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 and unless that parent becomes truly born again, saved, redeemed, then they begin to parent like God would have them parent. 
So if someone grew up in, in a very uh, abuse, a verbally abusive home, well, those parents just keep perpetrating that very issue onto their children, and it just keeps going until that cycle is broken. So if you grew up in that home, and especially the non-Christian home, you know, to me, you know, a Christian home shouldn't have any degree of verbal abuse whatsoever. Uh, but uh, oxymoron to say Christian home with, with verbal abuse. I, they're not coexisting, I, like oil and water. But um, if you grew up in a, a non-Christian home that had verbal abuse and you're a first-generation Christian, I applaud you. God bless you because that, that, that takes a lot. It takes a lot to get broken out of. So some of us have, have, have been uh, under uh, verbal abusive environments. I, I, I haven't. I've been around some people when I was younger, especially started out in construction. Man, some of those guys back in the day, those old timers, uh, they, they could be verbally abusive. You know, they, they literally could. So you got to toughen up and, and, and learn to talk back to the devil. But anyway, and um, so, you know, today if someone talked to an employee that way, of course, they'd be fine and in jail and have to go through sensitivity treatment and all that. But anyway, so, uh, but, you know, all joking aside, our words are powerful. So how much, there again, the Bible makes it clear, death is in the power of the tongue or life can be in the power of the tongue. So there again, Jesus, back to Jesus, John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they're spirit, they are of, of pneumaticos origin, they're Holy Spirit, originated, Holy Spirit designed, and that's what Jesus spoke. And uh, words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That word life there, the Zoe of God. It's, you know, John 10, 10, uh, I am come that you might have life, Zoe, which is there again, the life of God, the, the, the God kind of life that God desires for you. So there again, you connect John 10, 10, of course, the whole scripture, you know, when Jesus said, the thief coming up, where to steal, kill, and destroy but I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, right? So Jesus said, I'm come that you have life. The Greek word there is zoe. And uh, there again, it, I know you know this, it refers to the life of God, the, the life, the God kind of life that God has intended for you to have, okay? So Jesus reiterates that principle, kind of exegetes it in a, a different angle when he says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they're zoe, they are the life of God. So when we receive the life-giving word from God's word, that's why when you read this, and that's why you should read it every day. That's pretty good. I'll take that. I'll keep going. That's why you should read God's word every day because it's going to give you new life. It's going to give you new substance and sustenance in your spirit. Because when you're out there in the world every day, which you are one way or another, one degree or another, one length of time or another, every given day, you are bombarded with everything from negativity to hate to fear to worry to lies, gaslighting and propaganda and everything else. It, it, it's a very uh, spiritual and uh, emotional volatile cocktail. It is. So you have to replace all that junk that you're hearing and, and you, know, you need to limit it too. Yeah, that's why Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 4, be careful what you hear. I mean, some of that stuff, if you can tune it off and shut it off, shut it off. Turn to somebody and say, shut it off if you can. I mean, don't, don't subject yourself to that. It's like, no. Even, you know, if, it, if it's uh, internet, if it's uh, a radio or television, or you, you went to a movie, you didn't know what's going to go in that direction, get out of there and demand your money back. If they don't get, it harkens at least, if they don't give your money back, they'll at least give you a rain check for another movie. Now, I don't think the Chai Coms do that at AMC. That's why I don't go to AMC. But you know, the Chinese Communist Party, they own that. That's why, that's why I never go to AMC. That's why their popcorn, popcorn's deplorable. They don't know how to make popcorn. But anyway, so, so uh, I already got sidetracked. Where are we at? But don't listen to that junk, whatever it is, and however it's being communicated to you. Or if it's in a live setting, walk away. Say, up, oh, I'm out. You know, I'm you don't have to say that. You could just silently leave, you know. But So that, that's why you got to replenish yourself every day with the Word. There was a reason why there were six loaves of showbread in the tabernacle of the Old Testament. A reason why. It, 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 it was a type and shadow of Christ, absolutely, the, the bread of life. And he makes that, Christ makes that very clear in the New Testament. But also, you know, when, when Jesus was tempted 40 days, 40 nights, uh, we see the first, of course, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, man should not live 
by bread alone, but by everywhere that proceed out of the mouth of God. Here's the thing, when, when Jesus was tempted on three specific occasions during those 40 days and 40 nights, keep in mind, Satan came within the last couple days of the 40 day fast. Satan always waits until you're getting weak. But anyway, every single time Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Now here's the thing, three times Satan misquoted scripture. The audacity of him, huh? It's like the unmitigated gall of the devil himself, which he has unmitigated gall to begin with. Um, he, he's misquoting the word to the written word, to the incarnate word, misquoting it. So what do you think he's going to do to us? That's why you better know what this says. Like never, ever before. Never before. I mentioned this many times. I'm prompted to say it again. Book of Amos, God declared this to the prophet Amos. He said, this will be one of the signs, the last signs will be this. There will be a famine in the land, saith the Lord, but it will not be a famine of bread or water, but of my word, saith the Lord. There is a famine of God's word in this land. So the importance of the life-giving source of God comes from his word. We read it. We, we put it to memory as much as we possibly can. We live according to it uh, by the, to our utmost ability by God's grace, and it's producing life. You know, the Word of God, you know, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And then it even begins to, you know, it pierces and even divides. And what's real interesting there, the Word of God will separate our soul from our spirit even. I can't get uh, uh, on track on that, but I've taught it before. It was in a long, long time ago. The Greek terminology is called merismos, which is dividing asunder of soul and spirit, which that's what the word of God does. That's why a lot of people say, the Lord told me to do this, and no, he didn't. That came from your soul. That came from your seat of emotions. It came from your seat of your appetites, meaning your, your, your desires, your fleshly desires. Not all fleshly desires have to do with sin and sexual appetite. It, there are a lot of things that, that are even wholesome, but if, if misappropriated, and misapplied in, in certain cases, it could bring if not total destruction, it could at least bring a setback in someone's life. So that's why we have to know the word of God and, we ha and it'll help us discern, no, nah, that's in my soul, no, that's in my spirit. That's a, to be led of the spirit, you have to know what the word of God says. It, it's, I know this is simple, I know this is ABC Christianity stuff, but it's really important to be reminded of it. We need to know the word. So then we get the word, we get it in us, so we need to be speaking the word as much as we can, right? You can tell real quickly how much word people have in them. Yeah. Especially you talk about life, you can talk geopolitical situations, you can talk about uh, the societal trends, you can talk a number of things, and you can tell real quickly the degree of a biblical worldview a Christian has. And a lot of Christians don't have a very strong biblical worldview. So that's why, like never before, we need to go to the word, to the law, and to the testimony if they have no truth in them. God says uh, through the prophet Isaiah. So we have to go, what does the word say? We go to the word, we get the word in us, we speak it, we live it, we appropriate it, we cling to it, we use it when we are discouraged, we use it when we are devastated, we use it when we are on top of the mountain also, right? So, death and life and the power of the tongue, focusing specifically on us, make God help us use our tongue properly, right? Let me give you a scripture here. Memorize this, when I, when I was but a wee little lad, when I was a child, when I was a child, I remember, I could take it the place and time, but I won't. Um, going back a few decades now, we memorized this in Sunday school. One of the first scriptures I remember memorizing as a child. And it, it's in Psalm chapter 19, verse 14. It says this. I'm going to quote the King James Version. That's how I memorized it in. And that is, you know what? Uh, I think I gave that to you, didn't I? If we could put that on the screen, there it is. Bada bing. There it is. Excellent. Uh, I guess I shouldn't say that one. I'm uh, but a uh, little Godfather reference there. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Oh, we'll come back to that. Meditation of my heart. Be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We got that? Powerful, powerful scripture. This is, this is how we understand. I quoted this in week one. I'm coming back to it because I didn't, we didn't exegete it at all. So we're going to do that today in the last week here, this series. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Remember, we, we proved that week one 
That's why I quoted that rolling as I was teaching. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said this, that out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? Excellent, good job, excellent. You guys know that. Got that one down. The mouth speaks. So thoughts, and Jesus teaches that even and more fully, in, in, uh, and, it's, and it's discovered more fully also in the book of, of Mark, is that from the heart, evil thought, from the heart proceed evil thoughts. And he just, he goes through this litany, this list of things that come from the heart. Not only evil thoughts, right? So from the heart, the evil thoughts. Uh, he goes down to murder, adultery, fornication, uh, thievery, just, just a, a host of things. And the thing about it is, he makes it clear that, that they first started in the heart. So even the words that we speak, there again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when somebody's talking, it was already in their heart. Now, granted, there was a formulation of the words, and then they, they as they begin to articulate them, and, and the matriculation process occurred as they were passing that, that thought process from themselves to you, uh, what, what were they saying? And not only what were they saying, what was the spirit of which they were saying it in? Because you can't separate someone's heart from someone's vocabulary. You can't separate someone's heart because they're in heart and mind are synonymous in Scripture. Remember that? Um, heart and also spirit are synonymous in Scripture. So whatever someone is speaking, it's been on their heart, be it good or bad. Simple as that, right? So when, when David, the psalmist, this is, you know, this is a strong prayer here. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Now, you know, yes, he said, he said, words of my mouth first, meditation of my heart, because, but David knew the process. He knew the right sequential order because it started in the heart. Meditation of my heart. God, I want them to be acceptable, Lord. I want them to be acceptable, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, here's the thing. God can be our strength and our redeemer when the meditation of our heart is right, and therefore the words of our mouth are going to be right. Yeah. Or... God will be the antithesis of our strength and our redeemer. Even though we're born again, if our heart is meditating on gloom and destruction and we start speaking that, it's antithetical to the, car the character of God. It's antithetical to the nature of God, to the provisionary uh, benefit of God that he wants to uh, put in our life. It's completely opposite. So when we start speaking gloom and doom and and we're, there, there, there's a difference between being warned of something and focusing on that and developing this nihilistic mindset of life that, oh, the sky's falling and it's going to fall right now. Oh, you know, woe is us. We, 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 we're done. We're done. We're done. You know, <laughs> you can act like a man. Anyway, another godfather. So, um, so we, 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 we want to make sure that our heart is fit. That's why I said that few minutes ago. We got to fill our heart with the word of God because what's in there is going to come out. So we fill our heart with the word of God, the spirit of God, the spirit of life, the word of life. And then our words are going to be acceptable in the sight of God. But there again, before our words can be acceptable, the meditation of our heart must be acceptable. What are we meditating on? What are we musing on? What are we ruminating on? Rumination. Oh, oh, put an asterisk by that. Rumination. Put an asterisk by that. We're going to come back and visit that. That's my way I use that when I'm talking to my wife, my children, and, and, and something in private, I say, you know, and I, I'm going off on different things. I say, yeah, look, I'm going to put an asterisk right there. We'll come back to that later, though. <laughs> Rumination. You want to write the word? I just, we're going to come back to that one. I'm prompting the Holy Ghost. We're going to do that here whenever he brings it out later. So anyway, you know, to, to ruminate, ruminate and rumination is a definitive word for meditate. So ruminate just simply means, of course, help to define even meditate. It means to think deeply about, to ponder, to think, every, to think and look at every possible scenario of that which you are thinking about. So you're ruminating about something. There again, ruminate, ruminate and rumination helps to define meditation. 
So when, when, you're, when you're doing that, you, you are in deep consternation. And that word consternation, some people always want to use that in a negative way. It, it's not always used negatively. It just means that, there, that there, there is a concerted effort that your thought life now is laser-like focus on that given issue at hand in your life because you're, you know, I'm not, you're not obsessed with it, but you, you're almost consumed with it, okay? And sometimes it's warranted because you need an answer. And you've never been there, okay? You, you, you know, so you're looking at everything. You know, some people just do it real simple down to this. It's like, okay, get a sheet of paper. Here's pros and cons, yeah. right? Pros, cons, go down the list. Okay, uh, the cons outweigh the pros. We ain't doing it. If the pros outweigh the cons and you're still not sure, we'll keep praying about it. God will, God will let you know. So it's really that simple, but still it can be a very complex issue because if it's a more difficult issue in life, we're not talking about what you're going to eat today. You know, when it, when it gets to stuff like, uh, okay, this could alter the course of my destiny or it, could, or it could help shape it. When you're down to those kind of situations, you better do a lot of meditating. Now, granted, Eastern mysticism, the New Age movement, Christian science, scientists, they've all hijacked that word. And that's been going on in our society for a long time. Our entire English vocabulary has been hijacked. That's why I, I will still use words to how they were properly intended and meant to be and to do. That's why, uh, especially the Oxford uh, Dictionary, they're adding all of these new words that really aren't words, like woke. So the Oxford, because of that liberal bastion that they are, even though I know there are a lot of extremely intelligent people that are, that are attending there and have attended there in the entire uh, Oxford University complex, but... Um, but the, these words that really aren't even words, that, that now they're putting their stamp of approval on them. So that's why it's like, no, no, you, you, you've hijacked the English language. I'm going to use those words how they were meant. Gay means happy. Amen. And there is a chasm that cannot be, that cannot be bridged between gay and homosexual. Amen. So I'm going to use, I'm gonna, you know, we're going to speak truth here because the more truth you speak... It does a, wonderful, a lot of wonderful things. A very, truth is a very powerful thing. So don't be afraid to speak it. Don't be afraid to speak truth like never, ever before. What are they going to do to you? Speak truth. So, uh, so get focus back on this. So we understand that, okay, look, I'm meditating. I'm meditating. We're not going to let people hijack that word. I'm meditating. So many times in the book of Psalms, David was meditating on, on, on the things of God. You know what? Just real quick, like, you know what that word also means in the Hebrew language, the word meditate in the, in the Old Testament? One definitive word uh, you'll see for meditate and meditation in the Old Testament is musing. And sometimes it's translated musing even, Okay. You know, to muse, it also means to think upon deeply and ponder, etc. And, um, and sometimes that word can also mean muse, a source of inspiration. Oh, and that person's my muse. I'll tell you who, who your muse is. His name is Jesus Christ. That, that's your muse, okay? Your muse is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. They are the creator of all things good and wholesome and appropriate and knowledgeable and intellectual, okay? And by all means, spiritual. So they are your muse, okay? So to muse on something also means that it's real interesting when you, when you extrapolate that word. Here's, here's one of the ways that you, you muse and you meditate. Okay, what is it? I don't know if you got that, but I was humming hallelujah. So, is to hum, is to hum. Do you know, now I've, I've read, the, this is really interesting, this stuff fascinates me. I, I follow a few neuroscientists and, and, um, and neurosurgeons, and every now and then they call me for advice, and you know, we, we, we go back and forth, and and I help them all I can, you know, but some people just can't help. But anyway, neuroscientists have proven this. It's like, I say that kind of in jest. They've proven this, is that one of the greatest therapy for the August nerve and your, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system, 
which I, I, just, I got to stop there. I got to keep moving. Fascinating, fascinating how God created us. When David said we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Tell somebody, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then you can tell them you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, you are. You, you are a, a, a God-created machine. Unbelievable, right? Uh, so, so we have the parasympathetic nerve, nervous system, if you will, in some regards, but primary as nerve and then the sympathetic nerve. And they, of course, have different functions, obviously. But the vagus nerve, it runs, uh, need to say, from the brain all the way down to your body, and it controls everything. You know what neuroscientists have discovered? One of the best therapies for the vagus nervous system, which there again affects the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerve within your body, well, it, it helps to right you. If you're depressed, if you're grieving, if you're going through a difficult time in life, whatever, is to hum. To hum. What it does, it stimulates the vagus nerve. It stimulates your parasympathetic system and even your sympathetic nervous system. By humming, it literally sends the vibrations sent are sent down from your brain through your entire spinal cord, which eventually go all the way down to your toes. Bottom line is, it affects your entire being. And it helps preserve your well-being. See, say with me on this. I appreciate and I love to read and study true science. True science. Again, I say true science, okay? Everything that the CDC says ain't true science. Everything that who says, who, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the band with Roger Daltrey, and I, okay, the World Health Organization, everything they say is not true science. You do know that, don't you? Oh, you, newsflash, everything the UN says pertaining to health, it's not always true science. Newsflash, okay? I know that's, what CNN says about your health, uh, no, 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 they, 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 that ain't always true science, okay? MSNBC and go down the list. All the Marxist media outlets, no, 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 no. So anyway, but if you disprove them, okay, so anyway, and I digress. Thank you for your patience. Though. So it's been proven that it literally stimulates those areas which, which brings positive effect to your, to your body. Well, there again, musing, meditating, encompasses humming. Just for what that's worth. So we should, we should hum every chance we get. And it's a really, really good outlet for those who are like me, who can't sing, can't carry a tune in a bucket, you can hum in tune. You ever notice that? You can hum just beautiful. I don't know if that didn't help you, it helped me, but anyway, I'm just trying to help you guys, just sharing that with you. But anyway, so in other words, I'm out meditation of my heart, the meditation of my heart, the musings of my heart, the ruminations of my heart. I want those to be acceptable along with my words, oh God. I want to be whole. In every area of my life, I want to be healed emotionally. So when I ruminate and when I'm thinking about you, oh God, I know in conjunction with your word, I'm going to be stronger than ever before, whole like never before in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. You might want to write this down. The Lord said, share this with my people. So here it is. Your tongue follows your heart and your, and, and your life follows your tongue. It's as simple as that. Your tongue follows your heart. Your tongue follows your heart. So we just looked at in Psalm 19, of course, Matthew 12, quoted those two scriptures, keynote scriptures, there are many others. Your tongue is going to follow what's in your heart. And then after that, your heart is going to follow, then yeah, your heart and your life follows your tongue. So your tongue follows your heart, and then your life is going to follow your tongue. So what are you, what are you saying about your life? Uh, you can't do it. It's never going to happen. Not good enough. Not smart enough. Wrong color of skin? What, 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 what excuse do people want to keep using? Had a rough upbringing or brought up poor? 
Excuses, excuses are the fuel to destroy your destiny. Don't use an excuse. Listen, I'm not making light of anything I said that if, if, that, if that was you and your, 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 your history and even still tries to come back and to be your present state of existence, no, you, you can't let it. Life is too short. Believe me, this life is way too short. There are two things about life you need to understand. The fragility and brevity of life. And both of them are so real that most people don't even realize it. There's a fragility of life and the brevity of life. Life is very fragile. And sometimes portions of our life can disappear and, 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 and actually come and go more fragile than even a whisper. And then the brevity of it. I don't care if we live to be 102. That ain't nothing. The book of James says, what is our life? It is as a vapor which appears for a moment and then vanishes away. The older I get, the more I realize that life is so brief. It's so brief. Let alone when someone is, is it, comes to the end of their life at 29 or 18 and it, it just, it, it, you know, even, even at 54, just go down the list. It's like, wow, that was a life. Take out way too early. So we, so we don't have time to use excuses to fuel our destiny being derailed. The devil doesn't need any help to derail our destiny. Your haters out there, don't, you don't need to give them any fuel for them to try to derail your destiny. So don't do it. And don't sabotage yourself by fueling things that would try to derail your destiny. Speak life over your destiny. Speak God's security over your destiny. Speak the word over your destiny. Let that be accepted because there again, our, our life is going to follow our tongue. I've, I've grown up around and seen a lot of people, different, every walk of life imaginable. I think that's why I have, I have such a plethora of experience in different occupations, vocations, and, and then being around. I, I, I have literally, literally been around ditch diggers and multi, multi, multi millionaires and, 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 and been woven in the fabric of their life from the time I was in my teenage years until right now. And I still am on a, on a pretty regular basis, still am. And the thing about it is, you, I, I, notice, I, I notice that their tongue is directing their destiny. Be it toward destruction or be it toward greater success in God. Let's look at this real quick like. Go, go with me over the book of James. Okay, that was my introduction. Okay, let's get the book of James. We're going to pick it up here. How are we doing? We doing all right? God bless you all. Father, those who said awesome and those who said yes, amen, God bless them. The other ones still bless them because I love them too. <laughs> but may they never miss an opportunity again, Father. <laughs> and I know, oh, he meant that. Out of the out of the mouth, <laughs> out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that's where you have to be careful. And that's why sometimes I can go a little too far when I I kind of kid around. But yeah, man, I I never mean will toward anyone, especially just joking around because you you, you do you got to bring some levity to life, amen. And you, it can't go to the point of foolish jesting. King James version. Paul teaching a young apostle by the name of Timothy in the first in Timothy in First Timothy, saying, you know, but 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 put away foolish jesting. You know, that so that's not foolish jesting, but there again, just a little humor every now and then. It's all right, it's all right. Um, my brethren, you the people of God, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Obviously, King James Version. I, I've quoted this several times, not too long ago, even it just means the words that we speak. Those who, who are in a, a, a position by the gift and grace of God, a position to speak and teach the word of God, to preach and teach the word of God, you're going to receive greater judgment, a more severe and more strict judgment. Um, that's why 
uh, it's, it, it, it's very, very, very important to make sure that someone is truly, truly, really called in the ministry of any level, of any level, of any level, by all means, because the more that we've been given the opportunity to teach and preach God's word, the more stricter and stringent judgment that that person will be placed under. So, and, and I realize that, and it's very sobering. I, I think that's why over the last, uh, maybe a couple decades or so, I kind of balance it with just trying to stay a little grounded. If not, wow, it's like I, I can get really sober really fast and really, my, my wife gave me, I think one of the greatest compliments I, she's ever given me, and uh, which I've probably never given her enough because it, it, if I started, it would take every hour of every day, and I mean that with all of my heart. Phenomenally wonderful lady Amen. in every regard of the word. But um, um, she said this the other night. She said, um, and there was this individual we, we were watching, and he's a former Navy SEAL, and, and the guy, he's, he's, uh, he's very intelligent, and uh, he was just communicating some stuff, and, and uh, she turned to me and she said, um, he reminds me of you, you remind me of him. She said, because of the weight, that not that he carries, but this that, that is on him. And, uh, and I, I just, I froze on that one. I, and then I even, I, I hit pause I, and I pondered that. I said, and tears came to my eyes. I said, I deeply appreciate you saying that. I said, that's, and I did, I said, that's, that's the greatest compliment you could ever give me. I, so we talked about that, and, and uh, so I won't go into that part of the discussion at all, but um, I, I have a propensity. My propensity really is not to joke and to, um, and to bring a little levity. That's really not my propensity, and I think the Lord has had to lighten me up a little bit over the last, I don't know, few years or so, maybe a little longer than that, but I still maybe not light enough in some regards. It's not that I can go dark and deep real quick, but... Um, when you, when you see things and know things and, and you try to balance with okay, how much should I tell, how much should I not say, Lord, what, what you've shared with me. And, and I don't want anyone to take this wrong. It's not that, oh, I'm, just, I'm way up there. That, that's not the issue. But Jesus even told his disciples, there are many things I want to share with you, but you cannot bear them now. So there, there are people, especially when, when you have, and don't anyone take this wrong. That's just how it works. Even in this smaller setting, we, we, we still have, have sheep and lambs. So if you notice, Jesus told Peter, one of the last things he told Peter, said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, then feed my lambs. So he let Peter know that, listen, there, 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 is, there are different levels of spiritual maturity. So you've got to make sure that, that it's not all feeding those who, who are fully grown in the things of God, but the lambs, too, who are learning and, and growing and endeavoring to mature. You've know, you got to make sure you're parsing that down in some regards to make sure they really can follow you. And that, doesn't, that, that may sound so arrogant that I'm so lofty. That's not the issue. But the issue is I, 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 can, go, I can go real deep fast and I, and I can go, if not careful, I can go to the side that most Christians don't want to know about. They want to know about what's coming. Don't want to know the writing on the wall if things don't turn. Amen. That's why... You know, Andrew Bonhoeffer, he, he was rejected by the majority of his peers. Uh, he knew more of the word than they did. <laughs> he was more intelligent about, all, about all, every pastor in Germany. And he was warned of, of what's to come because he just kept being prodded more and more as the time approaches. So he just kept letting, letting uh, the, the people he was passing pass to two different churches and letting them know more and more and more. And finally, you know, they shut him down. And all these pastors, because eventually when Hitler came into power, over 97% of the pastors went with Hitler. Can you believe that? I can easily believe that. We got hit with a little pre-trial of COVID. And they shut churches down. And the few that stayed open, very few that did, you know, granted some suffered some consequences. They were glad for it. Oh, you want to find me? Find me. Oh, you want to arrest me? Go ahead and arrest me then. I'm going to preach the gospel. So, uh, guys, and this is stuff that people don't want to hear, and that's the stuff I, I reserve, but sometimes the Holy Spirit brings it out. I didn't intend it, didn't premeditate it, but it just came out. But that, that's the stuff Christians really don't want to hear. You don't want to hear what is, is pretty easy to see. 
I mean, it's real easy to see, and that's why I always try to tell people, look, this transcends political affiliation. This isn't a political issue. This is a life and death issue now. Forget party affiliation. Because bottom line, it, it, this is where we're at. Here, here are the two parties that have formed. This isn't, and this isn't, this isn't uh, national politics. This is just how it is. Forget the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. Forget that. They, they, they don't exist. Here are the two parties that exist. The Neo-Marxist Party, which is formerly called the Democrat Party, and the Semi-Constitutional Party, which used to be called and still known as the Republican Party, because, because not even all those in the Republican Party are constitutionalists. Not all of them are the real deal. Not all of them are true Americans, patriotic, and not just patriotic Americans, but true Americans. I mean, you know, in some aspects, the house is being cleaned out. You probably know what I'm talking about. It's wonderful. And found out that some of them sitting on RNC boards have affiliation with communist Chinese spies. And that's in the Republican Party. So I'm not a party loyalist. I'm a constitutional. First and foremost, I'm a child of God. I am a child of God. First and foremost, I'm a child of God. I am a Christian, right? Now, in conjunction with that, and I thank God that we live in a nation that was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Was it even perfect in its, in its founding and formulation? No, no. Because anytime humanity gets involved, at least there's going to be a little bit of, of, uh, of junk in there. It's just that simple. But as a whole, the premise, the premise of this nation, the charter of every 13 of the colonies, the Mayflower Compact, why the, why the Puritans made the pilgrimage from Plymouth, England, to land on the shores, they were blown off course 400 miles, end up on the shores of Massachusetts, that's why they call that Plymouth, to this day Plymouth, Massachusetts, because that's where they came from. In the Mayflower Compact, in the writings of William Bradford, one of the, the, the first and, and most uh, prolific of, of their governors, made it clear that they came there to evangelize the indigenous people. And then by the time the 13 colonies, when they begin to formulate themselves into a given colony, every single one of them, you can still read this today, in their charters, they all say in their own way, what they are doing is for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In, in one way or another, all of them say that. You can go home and read this. You could Google it and find it right now. It's getting harder to find when you go, when you go through Google. At least go through DuckDuckGo, that helps a little bit, at least for right now. But, but uh, all of that, it's common knowledge. The 13 colonies, they, they chartered by saying, we, are here for the preservation and the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people who live here and who are here before us even, and those who shall come after. Our, our nation was founded on those principles, and they're being stripped away every single day. We are living, there is a Marxist takeover of this nation, and what's sad is so many people, and especially in America, they have no idea of history. They have no idea of history whatsoever in any shape, fashion, or form. You mentioned Bolshevik Revolution, and you might as well be talking Greek or Hebrew or Farsi. Maoism, what's that? You know, so you start talking this stuff, and, and, and it's like you gotta re-educate people and educate people on the things that are going on. And then, of course, many Christians say, oh, we don't wanna hear that. Back to Bonhoeffer. Churches he's pastoring. I didn't want to hear it. You know how the rest of the story ended, don't you? So to see this percolating now in this nation and to see that the majority of Christians and pastors, because the majority of pastors, they just want to be popular now. When, when I was on that, I talked just a little bit about it last week. When I was on that merry-go-round, that roller coaster, one ride evolved into one, the two rides evolved into one. When I was on that, for a while, if I said, I'm, I'm off of this thing, man. 
And I'm, not that I'm better than them or anything, but it's like, no, man. If I'm going to do this thing, I'm at least going to be real. If I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to preach what God gives me to preach. I'm not preaching to try to get a large crowd and more money. One of the main reasons why pastors will not even t- preach truth anymore is because it's going to affect the bottom line. It's going to affect the bottom line. What's the bottom line? Money. Denary. Denary. You just go down another. It's, it, and, and, and it's sad, but, but, but churches are governed by money, not governed by God. Governed by popularity and not by a prophetic voice and witness. Oh, there you go. Pastor again. He's on his, he's on his soapbox. No, it's just how it is. And then sometimes you know, you gotta, I gotta, I, you gotta balance. It's like, okay, Lord. And I, what I do is because my style, it's completely, it is non premeditated. It's extemporaneous, as you can tell. I study, I pray, I know what I'm gonna say. Lord, here, here's, here, here's what you've given me. You take it from here. So when stuff like that, like right now, when it comes in and it works in, I realize that, Lord, you're prompting me to say this because it's easy for me not to say anything. You know, over the course of, especially the last several years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have left because they didn't agree where I said on, on COVID or vaccination or just go down the list, right? And I, when it comes to that, I, I've taken a stand in this regard. Whatever works with you, you, you go and do that. But as for me and my house, here's where I stand. Now, we don't have to be separated over it. And, and, and I, I never drew a hard line. I never drew a, a hard line in the sand. And, and even when, when people said, oh, you know, you, you, you better start doing that contact tracing. And I said, well, some, some, there are a couple of people there at that time. And I said, um, you know what? Let me go get some Sharpies. Let's just all write 666 on our forehead. I said, you, you, you don't see the ramifications of that. This is a slippery slope. So it, just many things like that. And uh, Deacon James Brooks gave me a book uh, a few weeks ago. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And, um, and it's about these issues. What, what's the title, Deacon? Uh, the Five Lies in the Anti-Christian Age. And it's written by a lady who at one time was the leading um, homosexual, but a lesbian uh, vocalist for the feminist movie, for the feminist lesbian movement. She is a professor at Syracuse University. She's got a PhD from Ohio State University. Kind, kind, kind of got a little high intellect there, right? Long story short, she got saved. She got saved, born again. She married to a pastor five children, I believe, and she homeschools. And one of, the things, one of the things she makes it clear is don't send your children to public schools. There you've got a PhD from Ohio State University. She was a leading professor at Syracuse University for years and years and years teaching women's studies, which included lesbianism, and she wrote a lot of the laws that are intact now for homosexuality and lesbianism that are now law, she wrote them before she got saved. And she starts attending because basically out of, oh, oh okay, what's well, one time, out of obligation basically. And, and also kind of first began out of this debate. And she couldn't argue this pastor who presented this. And her own testimony in part of the book, she talks that every, every, every one of her lesbian talking points as every one of her transgender talking points, every one of her homosexual talking points, he countered with the word of God. And she said he did it with grace and humility and kindness, but firmness. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because then you shall know the truth yeah. and the truth shall make you free. So she got set free. She divorced her lesbian partner, gave her, gave her heart completely over to Jesus Christ, and now is becoming one of the most, the most vocal and, and uh, articulate and intelligent spokespersons that, that stands against everything of the LGBTQ plus community because she knows the evil workings of it. Well, I was going to say, and I, I, don't, I, like to, I don't 
divulge private things whatsoever, but I did this sometime, somehow this will tie in. But I read the forward, uh, excuse me, the, the, the open flap of the book, and uh, Deacon Brooks, he wrote some very heartfelt things, very nice things, and, and the last thing he said was this, you are not alone. Amen. And he underlined, underlined that. And, and I appreciate that until I take my last breath. I will appreciate that more than he will ever know more than you will ever know, because sometimes, you know, when you, when you stand and, and contested with pastors who've gone so woke that they literally refuse, literally refuse in their own way to preach the word of God, that, I, I lose sleep over that stuff. I don't lose sleep over who doesn't like me and who's talking bad about me. And when those thoughts go through my mind while I'm, while I'm going to sleep, they leave real fast and I say, what am, what am I going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning? So I don't, that stuff doesn't phase me. But when I know, and you know, people have even asked me, and I, and I haven't told, I never told really the truth. I'll tell everyone the truth now. Why don't you have those guys who used to come here? Why, why don't you go and preach at their churches? Well, for, that, for this reason. One of the reasons why we stopped doing all the missionary work and, 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 and the founding of churches and buying pastors' cars over in third world countries and buying property over there and, 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 and donating over a course of time million dollars to help build their sanctuaries and all that kind of stuff. Well, the last time I go over there, when I found out they now espouse homosexuality, and it's, it's like, no, I'm out. How can two walk together except they be agreed? And, and, and teaching more psycho babble than anything else in the word. Now, there are some left. There are some left out there doing that. I think I even mentioned a couple last week, and God bless them for, for that level that they're doing that. Because this is not, we're at a war. There's a war going on. We've got to wrap this up, and it's war over words. So anyway, wow, James 3.1. Hmm. Let's keep going. Notice this. Verse three, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths and, that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Because in verse two, he makes it very clear. The words that we speak, if someone speaks properly, uses, the, you, you know, uses right words from the right heart, it's because they're able to bridle the whole body. And then when he, when he makes it very clear in verse 3, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. I don't know if you've ever been around horses, but, you know, just a small apparatus. You control that whole horse because of the bit in its mouth. Take it left, take it to the right, stop it, etc. Give it some slack and say, giddy up. <laughs> then it knows it can go, you know. You're controlling that entire horse like that. You're, you're, you are in control of that horse. It's not controlling you, unless it's a demon-possessed Shetland pony. But anyway... <laughs> You are in control of that horse. You're in control of that horse. So, so James, he begins to segue into the comparison of little things that can control something big. And then he says uh, in verse 4, Behold, also the ships, which, which though they be so great, they're driven of fierce winds, Yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. We're going to come back to that. Verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member, very small, right? But it boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. That word iniquity, it means not only unrighteousness, but it means ungodliness and it even means anti-godliness. So the tongue... The tongue can prove that that person is unrighteous, ungodly, and anti-godly. Just from someone's tongue. You've been around them, haven't you? You've been around them. So he makes that very clear. Uh, the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defiles the whole body. The words that we speak can defile our very existence. Can defile our very existence. And set it on fire, the course of nature, and set on fire of hell. Our tongue can set on fire. The course of nature, one of the things that means is our destiny. That's why I was saying a lot of that earlier. People can ruin their destiny by the words they speak. That's, I get this from the book of James, James chapter 3. Many people have 
negatively, destructively altered their destiny by the words that they speak. I about forgot about this. Rumination, right? Rumination. Okay, listen to this. The acronym is, uh, you know, because of time, let's just go ahead and put it up. Rapid onset gender dysphoria. That's the acronym, okay? This is used uh, everywhere from public schools, uh, the, uh, the demonic medical community, I, I, because I, 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 believe there is a, I believe there is a godly segment within the medical community, and I believe that there is a demonic segment in the medical community. Because I, I believe if a doctor would prescribe, you know, you know, you know what those hormone blockers are. You know, you know where they were first used for, right? And they're still used on occasions. It, it's for lifelong convicted pedophiles. It's to sterilize them. That, that's the drug that they're giving teenagers and adolescents known as puberty blockers. That's a demonic doctor. If a doctor would perform surgeries that will mutilate a body, that's a demonic doctor. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from. There's a demonic segment of medical, uh, the American Medical Association. Then, there, I, then I, I believe is a is a is a, a, a godly segment. I do believe there are many doctors still left that they they are applying the, the, the Hippocratic oath. First and foremost, Hippocratic oath: do no harm. Do no harm. You break that, you're not a doctor. You're a butcher. You might as well work for Hitler in Auschwitz. Simple as that. Or might as well work for Lenin or Stalin or Mao Zedong or Hitler. Just go down the list, okay? So it's rapid onset gender uh, dysphoria. And, you know, I, do, I, 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 I like to just figure things out. I, I just want to know, especially societal issues. I want to know. And I know bottom line, this whole thing about transgenderism, and, and this is very accurate, the rapid onset of it. And so when I came across this, because this is what I've been grappling with, I, I know, because the enemy knows this, more than Christians do, the enemy knows from the word of God that his time is at hand. We are in a day and time. And yes, it's more than just being the 21st century. Yes, it's part of, but it's even more where Israel is at and what's going on there. Yes, it's part of uh, the apathy of the church and, and the impending uh, separation, judgment, and revival that's going to come out of that in the church, and all of that, you're seeing it now, the, at least the beginning embers of it. Um, all of that mixed into one and a few other things, but it's, the enemy knows his, his, his time is at hand, and he's going into overdrive. Amen. He is working more rapidly than ever before. And I mean, come on, I mean, in 10 years, in 10 years, you don't recognize our society. You don't have to go back 20, 30, 40 years. Oh, we should go back to 1952. You don't have to go back that far. There again, you go back 10 years or less, and it's like, what happened to our society? You know where a lot of that can be blamed at? The church. A lot of it can be blamed at the church. And there, there again, the enemy knows his time is limited. It's at hand. So he's just ramping up everything. So I've been wondering, so, you know, so I know all that, but it's like, okay, okay, but what's causing the rapidity? What's, what, what's, what's fueling that? And some very learned individuals who are on our side, one of them was the lady I was referring to earlier from that book that was given. And I thought, wow, there it is. It's, it's, it's this phenomenon called co-rumination. Co-rumination. And, you know, Brother Jake, just go ahead and put the definition up. So co-rumination, the excessive sharing, the excessive sharing of hardships. Let's just focus on that. So you have young adults, you have adolescents even, those pre-puberty, mid-puberty, even post-puberty, they fall in that category, be they, be they boys or girls. This rapid onset of gender dysphoria, it's being fueled. And, I, and I, you know, I've read this like eight times and I just pondered it and meditated on it the last several days. And I'm, I'm going, that's it. That's it. So this co-rumination, here's what's going on among the youth subculture. 
those who are having an ear to hear the co-rumination, because that works both ways. When Jesus said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And those in the world, they have an ear what the, they have an ear what the de devil's saying to their congregation, and they pick up on that. So they got this co-rumination going on. So the excessive sharing of hardship, especially through social media. I need someone to co-ruminate with me that my life is terrible and my life is miserable because I'm trapped in the wrong body. I need you to ruminate with me of this excessive hardship. I want us to ponder. I want us to think. I want us to look at every angle. I want us to meditate every single participle of this thought that we break it down, that we just excessively are focusing on this hardship. That it's so hard being trapped in this body that's not me. And they feed on that because they co-ruminate that of the excessiveness of that. And there again, social media, you got seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Just like Waffle House. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Anytime you can click in. Anytime, day or night. Christmas. New Year's Day. It don't matter. It's always open. They're like Motel 6. They'll leave a light on for you. A devil will leave a light on for you on social media. People get there, oh, the light's on. Well, yeah, and it says vacancy. You can check in any time you like, but you may never leave. You get entrapped in that stuff, it takes God Almighty himself and the power of the Holy Ghost and the shed blood of Jesus Christ to set people free from that addiction. And it's an addiction. I don't care what anyone says. And it's being proven now. Oh, like, oh, newsflash. Social media can be addictive. You don't say. Oh, it took a worldly psychologist to prove that. So you got this excessive sharing. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And so then it's coupled with this. So I wanted to get it. I was going to quote this early, and I said, I, and I had this, this is how I memorize stuff. I write it down, and I look at it every chance I can, especially when I'm driving, you know, put it right in front of me. But anyway, and uh, so I, I was going to quote this at the outset of, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, want, want me to share this too, and weaving this in with the power of words and everything. And I, and, I, and I realized, you know, I have it written down. So I gave it to Jake. I said, Jake, type this up. I'm going to use it somewhere, somewhere, and here we are. Because this is what I also wanted to show everyone. I say many of you already wrote it down or took, took a picture of it. So not only the excessive sharing of hardships, but the negative feedback yeah. in seeking, meaning self-affirming, yeah. approval of. So I want the negative feedback from that other person. <laughs> Internally, I'm seeking that as we excessively talk about the hardship of being trapped in the body that we're not in, we shouldn't be in. And everything connected to that, all the hardship, this, the, the, the composite hardships of trying to live in this world and no one understands. And we, you know, we, whatever it takes, we, we, I've got to have the surgery. I've got to have, no, call it what, mutilation. I, you know, I, I need those drugs that, that will sterilize me like it does uh, convicted pedophiles. So that's, I, I'm longing for that. And so there again, as they are co-ruminating, the other person is feeding that. So, what the, the, so they are each actually receiving the self-approval and the, uh, within the in-seeking, the internal, internally they're seeking after this and they get the negative feedback because they're speaking death to each other. They're speaking the same thing to each other. So the rapid onset really kicks in. And then of course, the sickos that fan these flames and the sickos that are pushing this agenda and trying to push it down, not trying to, are. You know, you know in, in Canada now, and, and, and the USA is, is really close. Canada, in Canada, parents do not have any rights over their children. You, you know that, don't you? 
One of the main things for a society to become completely a Marxist society, you take away two things, bottom line, besides taking away guns. You, you take away, primarily, you take away four foundational things. If it wasn't armed citizenry, you got to make sure they're, they're taken away. If they did have free speech, you got to take that away. And then the last two things that remain to keep people free is this, private property and the family unit. This, this rapid onset of gender dysphoria, that's the fourth prong of the attack. It's the fourth prong. I mean, our rights, if you own guns or don't, if you hate it, 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 it doesn't matter. They're in, the, they're in the Constitution, Second Amendment. It has nothing to do with being part of militia. It has nothing to do with that. It's to oppose tyranny. Why is it that before Hitler came into power, he confiscated all guns? Why is it that Vladimir Lenin, when he came into power, the Bolshevik Revolution, he confiscated all guns? And Stalin just went to the exact degree to make sure no guns were, were even to be found in all of not only Russia, but also Eastern Europe. Why do you think Mao Zedong did the same thing? I don't know about you, but there's a pattern there. There's a pattern there. I'm not preaching pro-gun. That's not the issue. The issue is pro-freedom. Freedom of speech. And then private property. I mean, it's being seized more and more, and they call it eminent domain. You're too vocal in certain areas, they will take your business. They're doing it all the time. Do you ever connect the dots? Those businesses that are being seized... And, and don't you love how this Marxist regime does it? They send in a SWAT team. Yeah. And the people haven't even done anything wrong. Bust down their doors, three in the morning. And CNN just happened to be there. Well, that was a sealed warrant. How'd CNN know they were going there? How did MSNBC get there before the SWAT team did? It was a sealed warrant. Just connect the dots. Why churches are being shut down. Oh, I, church. FBI informants coming in, recording stuff, taking pastors out, saying, no, you can't preach anymore. Yeah. We're going, now we're going to point. Th this stuff is going on. And I don't know if people don't care, Christians don't know, or Christians don't care. I don't know. But it's a precursor to lose everything we got when it comes to our freedom of speech. And this. But let's just give more bread and have more circuses. We gotta close. Like never before, we better push back and stand up for our rights and what is right in Jesus' name, amen? Simple as that. Let's go ahead and stand up. I'm not finished, but I got to quit. So we're going we're gonna to come back. I'm going to finish this because there are four things that, that will help you to make sure you are always using your tongue properly and to make sure that you, you are steering the ship in the right direction. Because if that little rudder, that little helm, can steer, can, can steer a huge ship, even in the midst of storms, and that rudder is a metaphor for our tongue. If our tongue can steer us through major storms in life until we reach our destination safely, we need to know how to use them. We need to know how to speak up. We need to know what to say. We need to know how to say it. And especially over our life, we need to speak the word of God like never before. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for the power of your word. We thank you, God, that you have not raised us to be fools. Lord, your word declares we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And we see his devices like never before working in our nation and our society in greater ways and even powerful waves. So, Father, we ask that that tide be turned. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we speak unto that evil tide. Come on, church, join me. Let's do that. God, we speak by the authority you've given us. We speak against that evil tide, that tide that wants to crash and demolish the lives of people, the lives of the innocent, the lives of the young, 
the lives of children even, oh God. The God that they're even trying to take our children from us. They're trying to take our grandchildren from us, oh God. And God, we see the pattern. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're not ignorant of how he infiltrates and eventually overthrows a given nation. And God, we will not keep silent. We will lift up our voice and we will proclaim this is truth. We're going to live by it. We're going to declare truth. We're going to stand up for truth. We're going to preach and teach and talk truth in order to see the captive set free. In order to see those who sit in darkness can come into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. So Father, help us to be bold as lions like never before. Help us to be bold as lions like never before, oh God. And we will not lose our voice, but we will gain our voice. And that voice will be one of freedom, one of truth, one of restoration and healing, repentance and salvation. Help us to do that, oh God, and preserve this great and mighty nation, the last bastion of hope to a lost and dying world, a nation that sends more missionaries and gives more financially to spread the gospel to the world than all other countries combined throughout the world, God. So we know why the enemy is attacking us for that reason alone and many other reasons. So God, keep this nation free. Keep it strong. Keep its people informed. Keep its people empowered. Keep the Christians in this nation, oh God, to be that light that's set on a hill a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid, and that light that cannot be hid. Help us to be those people to communicate your word and help us to speak faith. Help us to speak hope. Help us to speak life over each other and over the situations we're dealt. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say amen and amen and amen. God bless you, love you. Thank you for being here. Have an incredible week. We'll finish this next Sunday. Be blessed. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.